How do we live this thing called life? So many opinions, so many messages. Everywhere you go, they tell you how we should live it. I saw a sign recently that said, Coke adds life. And I thought to myself, does Coke really add life? And that was the wonderful marketing they had. And we know, they don't tell you the other thing about Coke and what it does to you, but it's supposed to add life. And there's so many things that we look around this world and people are saying messages about what's important, how we should live our life, what we should do. And it is confusing. There's so many things that we need to take into consideration. Are people telling us the truth? Are people lying to us? Is there something that I need to do more than what the world tells me and the things that I hear? And then we have this person come to this world. His name is Jesus. And he comes to this world and he speaks to us things that are profound, things that are eternal, things that change the course of the world and change our lives. I like to open up our Bibles, all of us open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6. We read a bit of it last year. I want to go back and basically start where we finished off. Matthew, chapter 6. And I'll read all the, all the chapter. Matthew, chapter 6. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Otherwise you have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound the trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly and when you pray you shall not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on corners of the streets that they may be seen by men assuredly i say to you they have their reward but you when you pray go into your room and when you have shut your door pray to your father who is in the secret place and your father who sees you in secret will reward you openly and when you pray do not use vain repetitions that the heathens do for they think that they are heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you give men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. And if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting but to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you openly. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God or mammon. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is that not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither reap, for they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valued than they? Which one of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? 
So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek the first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Here we have the Lord Jesus Christ. His real introductory sermon to all the people around him, to the Jewish people. He was what many would consider the new kid on the block. All the Jews have heard, and they would have gone to the synagogue, they would have heard about all the Old Testament people, Moses and Solomon and David, and telling them how, what they did and how they lived. And Jesus comes along and he says these things to them. And I guess, like you and I, the first time you heard these words, though not only were they profound, but they went somehow against the grain. They went against the grain from what the things that we normally hear. And Jesus explains and outlines what he's saying here by telling us this. And he adds the element of eternity. And he adds the element of a God, a Father who cares about us, who looks over us. But not only that, a Father who rewards. A Father who rewards those who follow him. Those who do the right thing in their heart. Those who follow him and decide that I'm not going to be a man pleaser, I'm going to be a God pleaser. You know what? When I do my charitable deed, I'm not going to announce it to other people. I'm not going to beat a drum. I am going to keep it secret. And here Jesus says, if when you keep it secret, your heavenly Father will reward you. Don't worry. You will be looked after. And that element of being looked after is not only here on earth, but eternally looked after. That God will care for us and he will look after those that love him. The Bible says this to us. No eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor is entered the heart of man what God has got prepared for those that love him. Have that verse in your heart tonight. Think about that verse as we go through what we're going to be studying tonight and what we're going to be looking at. And the main part of tonight's sermon starts from verse 19. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus is now giving us a life direction about what is important. And he's saying to us, do not lay up treasures here on earth. And it is important to understand that he does mention treasures. He doesn't say, do not lay up for yourselves money because we've got to work. The Bible, in fact, says that if you don't work, you don't eat. Be wise with what you do. Invest and do the best you can with regards to your study. Do the best you can with your study. Be the best you can. All these things around us, be the best. Try to achieve the best you can. But never, never does it translate and metamorphose into a treasure in our heart. That's the condition here. That these things and the world around us and the things we own and the things we have stay at arm's length. They don't become our treasure. And when they become our treasure, that's the problem. Many years ago, there was a cartoon strip and the cartoon strip was called Charlie Brown. Maybe some of you can remember the cartoon strip. Many years ago, there was Charlie Brown 
the main character, Snoopy the dog, and there was one other character, Linus. And him, he was a kid, and he had something that was really important to him. He would carry around a blanket. It was a blue blanket. Everywhere he went, it was his blanket. And it became so valuable to him that it was his security blanket. He couldn't go anywhere without it. And throughout the series, for many years, they used to use him as a character and they used to tease him. And people used to steal his blanket and put it away. And he used to go into depression and he used to be so anxious. Where's my blanket? Where's my blanket? You see, what happened to him was this. To us, it's just a blanket. But to him, it was his treasure. That blanket was more valuable than anything he had. It translated to something that it shouldn't have been. That is, that blanket affected his emotions. And that blanket got, went into his heart and changed him and moved him. And he felt terrible when it was taken away from him. The metamorphosis of the things of this world into treasures is what brings us ultimate pain. The more we love something, the more it hurts us when we lose it. That's what Jesus says to us. We are to, the first greatest commandment is to love the Lord with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our soul. And when you read those words, you say, you know, Jesus, don't you want us to have fun? Don't you want us to enjoy life? But in that loving the Lord, it protects our heart. When we love the Lord, the Lord blesses us and fills us, and everything becomes arm's length. You know, Charles Spurgeon, one of the preachers in England, used to say, we live this life like on a boat, a little, a little boat. And we're sailing along. We're on top of the water, but we never let the water get into the boat. We never let th those things become treasures in our heart because that becomes the issue. Because then when they're taken away, and one day they will be taken away, the thieves will get them, the rust will get them, all these things will take them. Nobody leaves this earth with the things they've had in this life. You don't see on the hearse a trailer saying, you know, well, I'm taking everything with me and, you know, make sure I have it and put it all into the, um, into the coffin and I'll take it with me. Many years ago, uh, they had a Tutankhamun exhibition here at, um, in the city, and I think the Kajosas went too. And that exhibition, it was the exhibition called King Tut's Exhibition. And I went there thinking that I'm going to see King Tut at the end. And you go through there, and basically what it was in his um, particular pyramid that he had, when he, was, uh, he died, they put all these things of the world, all the possessions he had, and they put them with him, thinking that he's going to take them with him. He, that's what he thought. He's going to take them to the next life. He even had servants in there who what they did was they actually closed the, the, uh, the brick wall from the inside. The oxygen stopped. They died because he thought King Tut was going to have his servants with him. They even had horses in there, thinking that he's going to go and be, take them to the next life. But no, they remained, and here they were at the Melbourne Museum for all to see. And again, it's telling us something. It's telling us the most important thing you have and I have is your soul. Your soul is so valuable. That's all we have. And the Bible says to us that, and Jesus says to us, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? What can you and I give in exchange for our soul? Absolutely nothing. And in this world where we hear messages about what is important, the only time we hear that the soul is important is when Jesus declares it in his word. He died for our sins. So our soul, our person, our being can meet him one day face to face. That's who Jesus and that's what he did for us. So we have this comprehension that understanding that the things of this world when they become treasures, that's the problem. Not necessarily the things to assist us and to live this life like they should be, but when they come into our heart. And the Bible says here, 
For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So this attachment to the treasure that we have is where your heart's going to be. And if it's not with God, and there's a constant battle, the Apostle Paul talks about fighting the good fight, fighting the good fight of your soul and Jesus Christ being Lord, that's the battle that we have. And then the things around us, they always want a piece of us, want to deceive us. The Bible talks about the fact that there's a devil. He deceived Adam and Eve. Remember in the Garden of Eden? He told them, you know what? If you take of the fruit, you know, this is going to happen to you. Your eyes are going to be opened. And they took and they suffered and they died. They were lied to. And we are lied to, brothers and sisters in Christ. We are lied to. But the condition is this, that we don't treat the things of this world as treasures. And you're going to say, and just like I've been thinking, sometimes it's hard. Something so easy. Something, we, we get attached to things. Some people get attached to the garden. Some people get attached to the uh, food, get attached to all sorts of things. You know, oh, I've got my garden and I've been looking after it and there's this bird that comes and eats my fruit and tomato and I get upset. I'm thinking, why am I getting upset? It's just the fruit. You know, why is it affecting my emotions? And that's how simple it can be. But then when you extrapolate it into the bigger things, the bigger things that we need to be weary of. There was one man in the Bible who dealt with this situation. Satan went up to God and said, you know what, your servant Job, you know that the only reason that he follows you is that you've blessed him and that you've put a barrier around him. I tell you what, you take everything that away from him that he's got, he will curse you like every other man. And we look at Job and we see what he had. Now, Job it was many, many years ago. If you look at the timeline, it was probably just after the book of Genesis, uh, a couple of hundred years after that. So he's quite early in the uh, biblical calendar. But Job, he had seven sons, three daughters, and he had possessions. He had possessions... You know, I read them out, 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yokes of auction, 500 female donkeys, very large household. To us, it might not be big, but it was to that time. Because the Bible says this, he was the greatest of all people in the East. He was the greatest of all people in the East. This guy was the top of everything when it came to reputation. He had a family, he had uh, wealth, he had all of it, and he was the top, top person. You know, in your Forbes 100 and all those surveys they take, he would have been at the top. But he loved God. But he, 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 he loved God so much that when Satan was given the license to basically take away his kids. Take away his wealth. Take away all those things through various misfortunes. We read about him in, in Job chapter 1. He looks at the situations and he assesses it. And he says these words, these words, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I shall return. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And when you read those words, you can either say, well, how is he saying these things in this time? Does he really believe it? And I'd say he does. Because you can't say those things. He probably said it through pain and suffering, but it was a truth. The things that he had were not his treasures. They were things that were going to be useful in this life. But the Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. Naked I came, naked I should go. And that's what he did. And that's how he lived. And we see uh, later on the turmoil and his friends not really acting like friends, really giving him a hard time and saying, you know what, it's because you must have sinned for this to happen to you. 
And we see that it wasn't the case. And then at the end, we see that God blessed him again because he was tried and tested. The things of this world, including his family, were not his treasure. God was his treasure. That's who his treasure was. The Bible says this to us. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves a son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So we look at what Jesus says to us, we look at his position in our life, and we then comprehend that Jesus has to be our treasure. He has to be, because he is the Son of God. He died for our sins, and we're going to see him one day. And then we live that life knowing that, that Jesus is our treasure. You know, we've just gone through a couple of weeks of tennis. It's been all over the media because of... Um, Novak and all that stuff that was happening there at Djokovic and we, we saw what's happening there then we went through the finals as I'm not a tennis person but many of you would have seen who won and what happened there and uh, Nadal won the 21st his 21st Grand Slam and it was all tennis talk and the ratings were huge it was a lady Margaret Court she has won more Grand Slams than anybody else. More than the men and more than any other woman. And she went and she won Wimbledon three times. And she, the first time she won Wimbledon, she was so looking forward to it. And at the end, after she won it, she went into the dressing room, she said, is this it? I mean, is this what it means to win Wimbledon? And later on, in her searching, and she declares in her autobiography, the greatest day of her life, when she, when she was born again, when Jesus Christ came into her heart. No other day matches that. When Christ came into her heart. It transformed her. It filled her with joy. And those people in the tennis world are absolutely dismayed that there's something better than tennis. But you and I know, you and I who have been born again, you and I know that Jesus Christ is the answer. That Jesus Christ, through his spirit, he can fill our heart and soul like no other. He gives us hope in times of hopelessness. He gives us joy when there shouldn't be any joy, when it's it's not related to the events around us. It's related to my relationship or your relationship with God. When we come out of prayer and speaking to God and he fills us and he changes us and we call out to him and he, sp he speaks to us and we have this wonderful God who cares for us. You know, and I've read some time, you know, the tennis fraternity want to take Margaret Court's name off Senna Court. Well, Rod Laver's got Santa Court. She's got the next one, and her name's emblazoned on there because of her biblical stance when it comes to marriage. And she's been attacked from all sides. And the Bible says to us that it says the following to us: "Do not worry." It says, "Do not worry when people are, attack you." Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. So here we have Jesus understanding and the way he was going to be persecuted and he was persecuted to the like nobody else. He went to the cross. They put him on a cross. They hung him on the cross and they killed him for what 
He did good. He healed the sick. He gave life to the dead. But Satan had these people. And ego and pride and the devil took him to the cross and he died. But Jesus knows that anyone who follows him is going to be persecuted. If you stand up in your community and say the things that God wants you to say about standards of life and what's important, you'll be persecuted. You will. But Jesus says this to us. Rejoice because your reward in heaven will be great. So now we come to this part where Jesus says to us the following. Now, don't gather treasures here on earth, but I want you to do this, he says to us. He says, But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. So here we have before us a desire by Jesus for us to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And there are rewards. And the rewards are there. Jesus says to us in Revelation, Behold, I am coming back quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everybody according to their work. So Jesus comes, and he will come, and he will reward us. As night follows day, that's what he said, and that's what's going to happen. And it comes down to our faith and our belief in Christ. Do we really believe the word of God? Do we really believe it? And if we do, and then in your heart you'll know, you will be rewarded for the things you do in Christ. For the things that nobody else knows about. <laughs> where, where you do them in private. You know, we read earlier in Matthew, you know, the things that you do in secret, the Lord God will reward you openly. That's what he says he's going to do. And the reward is coming. The first thing we're going to hear is, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what we're going to hear. And it is, it takes faith to comprehend those words and to go into that spot, into that place where we believe them. The God reward you your faithfulness many years ago when i used to go to the footy and we used to go to back then it was footscray football ground and it became widden oval after that and it changed its name a couple of times and we used to see the faithful people you know what the old grannies they used to sit they used to get there early and they used to sit on the bench around the uh, around the boundary line, and they used to bring their knitting and their, their coffee, and you saw them, they were faithful. They were the first ones there. They were faithful. And God will reward our faithfulness. He cares for us. He will reward our faithfulness. And we see throughout the, the Bible, Jesus speak to, speaking to us and saying those things. And it's, we read in 1 Corinthians 16. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour <coughs> is not in vain in the Lord. That our work and the things we do for God is not in vain. We often have told that, and this is right, you know, you know God keeps a record of the things that we've done, the sins that we've done, but by the blood of Jesus Christ, all of it's washed, all of it's thrown, as the Bible says, into the depths of the ocean, to be remembered no more. But the things that we do for him, he never forgets. He never forgets. And when we open the scriptures and we come to church, we open the door to heaven. And we walk inside and we see a different world. You know, the lion, witch, and the wardrobe, if you've seen that, that movie, they go through the cupboard and they go into this world, into this scene, and they can't believe it. And I was reading something a couple of days ago about uh, when Captain Cook 
and all those other people came to Australia for the first time. And Banks, Banks was the, was the guy who was uh, into the flora and the fauna. And they were going along the coast of Australia and they never seen the things that they saw. They never seen a gum tree. They never saw the animals. They'd never seen them before. And they were completely astounded that these things could exist. And when they went back to England, they filled up the, the, the ship with all these things that were showing artefacts of Australia. This is what we found. And there were thousands and thousands of things that they found that they were never seen before. In the same way, when we venture into heaven, and tonight we do that, spiritually speaking, we open the door and we walk in. And the Bible says to us, I has not seen, nor ear heard, what God has got prepared for those that love him. That's what we've got before us. Something so wonderful and stupendous that words cannot describe it. And our faithfulness is going to lead us to that. There's more to this walk. There's more coming. When we die, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. It's like we're going to wake up from a bad dream. A dream of sin and suffering and pain. And we're going to be understanding that God cares about us. And we're going to look back and say, oh, how many times was I deceived? How many times did I not put my trust in Jesus Christ and I was deceived? And we have examples of this all the way through the Bible. There was a, a particular rich man, a rich man, and his crops were flourishing. And he says to himself, you know what I'll do? I'll build bigger barns because I've got to put my crops somewhere. And when as I build those bigger barns, I will say to my soul, relax, rejoice. You're going to have a long time here on this earth. Take it easy, your soul. And God calls out and says to him, you fool. Do you not know that tonight you're going to go? Do you know tonight you're going to leave this earth? And what are you going to have to show? And we have this fight before us. The word of God as our guiding path. And then we kind of have this comprehension that, do I believe what Jesus says to me? Do I believe the word of God? You know, many people, when they talk about the word of God, they talk about the, the bad things, the things, you know, they, they refer to the Old Testament a lot, about all the, you know, suffering and the things that God did to the people. But not many times do you hear in the world today about the glory of God, the heavenly home that we've got prepared. And as, and as we look forward and we see this home before us and this place before us, it lifts our soul. It lifts our heart. There's more to your faith in God than what you see. We walk not by sight, but by faith. We walk by the word of God. We walk by looking in our eyes, firmly fixed on Jesus Christ the author and the finisher of our faith. That's who we follow. We follow Jesus Christ and we look at him and we follow him and we believe his words. And it comes down to this. Do we believe his word? Do we really believe that we shouldn't have treasures here on this world? Because we know, practicality says that that will be taken the thieves will get them, the rust will get them, all these things will get them. Many years ago when I used to go to, to Ligon Street in um, all hours of the morning, we used to go to a particular place and um, a guy walked in, pretty scruffy looking, he had a big, big jacket and he'd be going from table to table and he'd be showing these watches and rings and he'd be saying, do you want to buy them? This is four o'clock in the morning, mind you. And we're looking at him and saying, what's this guy on about? And we knew, we knew one of the guys, one of my friends, his cousin was working in the place. And as soon as he left us, his, his cousin came up to us and said, don't go near him. Don't buy anything off him. You know what he does? 
he goes to the cemetery, Melbourne Cemetery down the road. And in the open grave, he goes in there, he takes all the stuff from the bodies. He takes the rings, he takes the watches, and he comes here to sell them. The thieves will get everything. The rust will destroy everything. That's why we don't make the things of this world our treasures. Because Jesus says to us, where your treasure is, there your heart and my heart will be also. Do you want to protect your heart? Do you want to be on the right path through this world? Give your heart to Christ and protect it. Make sure that he's got it. Because he loves us more than anybody in the whole world. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He came to this world. He died upon a cross. Not only that, he rose from the dead. And the fact that you and I can believe that, it's a gift of God. That he rose from the dead. He's alive. He's alive today. And when we speak to the Father, he becomes our intercessor. There's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ, his son. That's what the Bible says. And you know, many of you, like me, our lives have been transformed. We've been changed because of what Christ has done. And it is the greatest day of our life. And there's more to come. We will be rewarded without a shadow of a doubt that Christ will be there and we look back and the Bible says that he will wipe the tears away. And I guess maybe those tears will be there that, you know, well, it was a time of doubt that we were in this world that we were thinking, there's so many things I've got to look after myself and I, there's so many things that I've made a treasure of because everybody else told me to make a treasure of them. But thank goodness Christ has come in to our hearts. He's come to this world and he's coming into your heart. And he's given you light. And he's given you hope. And he's given you a heaven to come. May God bless his wonderful word in our heart tonight. And we thank him and praise him. Let us pray. Let's all stand if we could please. We'll pray. Then we'll have a song. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful again for Jesus. That he conquered sin and death. That he's alive today. That the cross could not hold him. That he rose from the dead and we have hope. And we know one day we too will be risen at his command. And we thank you for your word that outlines to us what we need to do with our life. So many different voices, but we thank you, Lord, we can hear your voice tonight. A time when your word is amplified and magnified. May all things fall into submission and may Jesus Christ be uplifted. We thank all this in Jesus' name. Amen.